In the spirit of reconciliation, the entire team at Curious Freedom acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connection to land, waters and community. We acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people listening today. I would like to acknowledge in particular the Darug people who are the original custodians on the land on which I record this podcast. Thank you for showing us what curious freedom can look like. Hi, welcome to the Curious Freedom Podcast with me, Kirsty Ferruja, and friends. And today I have my beautiful new friend, Kate Mason on. So welcome, Kate. Thank you for having me. So much fun and being a new friend is pretty exciting. We've got a lot of things to talk about. We do. So first up, everyone, you may have heard of Kate Mason before if you're following me on socials because I was on her beautiful podcast a couple of months ago. So you may recognize her and her voice if you went over and listened to it. But for everybody else, Kate, introduce yourself, please. All right. So I'm Kate Mason and my business is The Personality Coach and I'm passionate about finding out about people's personalities and helping them to understand themselves. So I am a mum of two and I've got a 30-year-old and a 28-year-old, so well past a lot of that parenting stuff. No, 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 lie. It never stops. And married, as I was just saying to Kirsty, for 37 years tomorrow. And I have found that the use of personality profiling and temperament and understanding all of that has actually made my journey to this point really quite easy. And my belief system is that if I can teach anyone and anyone can get a takeaway from anything that I talk about, just one thing can sometimes change your life. So my story behind my personalities is my husband and I got married when I was 25. We'd known each other for six years and we were arguing like cat and dog at our wedding ceremony and afterwards. And my sister-in-law handed me a book called Personality Plus, which talks about our temperaments. And we sat and read it. Well, Paul didn't because like I say, he doesn't read. So I sat down and read it and we realized after doing a questionnaire that we were two totally different temperaments. Temperaments are our behaviors. My husband's very very driven, loves a project, always busy, always organizing other people. I'm very much a people's person, love being with people, having fun and a really good time. So we sat down and went, oh my goodness, do we really want to stay married? Because gee, you're so different to me. However, what draws us together is often the thing that drives us apart. And when we sat down and realized that actually we were a really great combination, if we could understand each other's best bits, the parts that were really good for us. And here we sit 37 years later, not saying it's all easy, but having tools to handle your relationship makes life so much easier. Mm -hmm. We then had a son when I was 33 and this child three years later I had to look at the temperament book again because he was such a different soul. He was neat and tidy and organized and structured, and my husband and I were not like that. So I read all about him because sometimes it doesn't show up early, temperament or type, but in Jack it was very early. And I was able to parent him in the way that he needed to be parented, not the way I wanted to parent him, but to help him grow into himself and to understand other people as well. And then two years later I had my daughter, She was a mixture of my husband and myself. And so we all actually get each other. So that's my story. So from then on, I did the Myers-Briggs type indicator, which added another level of understanding people. And here I am today. Yay! And I'm so (laughs) thankful for our paths crossing and long-term listeners of my show will know how much I love the Enneagram and I love personality typing because I love understanding myself more and more as the older I get. (laughs) And I love trying to understand others. <laughs> I don't get it right. I don't do it well all the time. You know, with a lot of these personality typings, it's easy to make presumptions about other people <laughs> and it is. judgments about other people. And sometimes we can be really wrong on their motivation, mm. but not so much with the personality typings that you talk about. So yeah. I got you on the show because I'd love to talk to you about personality typing and all of it. 
but Mm -hmm. how it could potentially relate to our propensity to gather clutter and our challenge in letting go of clutter. And then also, I'd love to chat to you about how it relates to how we can better understand these personality typing so that we can better motivate, encourage, come alongside other people we may live with. Mm. And other people we work with yes. and friends that we have. <laughs> yes, yes, very much so. So what I'll do is I'll just take, there are four sets of preferences. And the first one is extroversion, introversion. And to just get rid of the common perception to start with, introverts are not necessarily shy and they can have lots and lots of friends, which is just something that I think because it's such an extroverted world and extroverts are busy selling themselves out there, you know, lots of friends and out there chatting to everyone, that that's not a truth. So we need to dismiss that straight away. So with extroversion and introversion, it's where you actually get your energy from. So are you energised by time alone and quiet, reading books, uh, listening to music, or are you energised by being in the outer world with other people, doing things that engage you outwardly? So the thing about that too is that it is an extroverted world. So therefore, a lot of people have to extrovert. If you're an introvert, you really can't hide under a rock, I say, because you can't. It's not the world it is today. So a lot of the time, introverts have to almost become ambiverts, as my son says, because he insists he's an ambivert, because they actually have to push themselves and they have to use their opposite preference and often they get really good at it. And sometimes it's really hard to distinguish that difference for them and for other people. So I always get back to, all right, so where's your energy? You know, find that energy and see where it comes from. So when we're actually talking about cluttering and decluttering, I was thinking about that as my house became really cluttered this week. And I mean, I know it's not long-term clutter, but because an extrovert is really energized by being in the outer world, a lot of the time I spend my time out of the house because why would you want to be there? Okay. So (laughs) I look around uh, when I come home, sometimes I do a really quick tidy up afterwards, but my house can become overwhelmingly full of chores and full of things to do because I'm not sitting at home. Now today I've had to sit at home and I have got so much done (laughs) (laughs) that I'm really excited because that means I could go out all day tomorrow. But it's, it's interesting because an introvert, if they're at home and having quiet time, they might quite often be looking at things that might be annoying them or might feel cluttered or they might need to put away. So that's just a bare thing. That's not talking about piles of clutter, but just part of when we look at cluttering, that's just part of something that could be like that. The next preference is intuition and sensing. Now, intuitives are often the people that were call quirky and interesting and different. And those people often have a really, they see things from the big picture. They see the end result. And then they come back downstairs to get to see the details, but they're not really caring about the details. I actually was out with a girlfriend yesterday who's intuitive and she was telling me about medicine and uh, she was talking about medicines, the naturopathic that fix things. So I'm a detailed person. So I say to her, so what, what's it made of? How, how Tell do me you do more. that? Tell me yeah, more. Where do you, where do you get it from? She said, oh, I don't know any of that. <laughs> you know, it, it works type of thing. So the sensing type can be very frustrating for the intuitive type because we try to bring them down and ground them and they have lots of different ideas. So if you're listening, we'll talk about that later and what it is to do with your relationships with other people. In terms of clutter, the sensing type often loves traditions and habits and putting things in place. And often they can clutter by building up a lot of things that are very valued to them traditional. Mm. Um, I've actually got three Christmas trees in my shed at the moment (laughs) because I'm saving one just in case somebody needs it in their house, you know, when they grow up. And my husband tried to throw it away and I'd spoken to Kirsty about clutter, but I did hang on to one of them. We did get rid of one, Kirsty. So (laughs) we build a lot of our clutter around, oh, I must keep that because just in case, you know, there's, there's something that might happen that there's we a practical to to reason. Yes. Yeah, there's all that practical stuff. The intuitive's clutter might be a really different looking clutter to a sensing clutter because they often like really different objects. They'll often collect unique things. So their thing might be that this is unique. I'm going to hang on to it. So a friend of mine who's an intuitive, she has very old cupboards that she's kind of redone and they're in her house and she needs to get rid of a few because they're overwhelmingly big, but she's attached to the story behind them. Okay. So there's a story sitting in these cupboards, whereas I can get rid of that kind of stuff because 
doesn't serve a practical need. No, no. So that can go. So then we've got the thinking and feeling types. So thinking and feelings based on thinking's logic, feelings, values. So the thinking type people are really logical. So when you've got a sensing type and a thinking type, you've got a super logical person. So the thinking people will often be quite logical about whether they need something or not. They can often be quite non-emotional about an attachment to something. So feeling people might be attached to it personally and sentimentally. And I love your description of the cup that you used. Your grandma's got a whole china set and you could keep one cup out of that. I really love that because there's stuff that I've got in my cupboard that I'm letting go of for that very reason that I'm never going to use the whole thing. But one cup's got its sentiment attached to it. So that's all cool. Yeah. So thinking and feeling type. So remember feeling people looking at values and how it affects people. Thinking people are looking, is it logical? Do we really need to do that? Does it make sense? And the last one we have is judging and perceiving. And I was talking to Kirsty about this. And this really is to me the biggest part of clutter and where you put things. Some people are just naturally born tidy. I don't care what anyone says. It's almost like they come out of the womb and they're just really tidy people. And for them, it's just natural to put everything back in the drawer, straighten up pictures, move your, I I have a friend who comes in and she straightens up all my bowls that I have around the place. (laughs) And I let her, because she's a really good friend and we do the Myers-Briggs together. She uses it in business and we use it. She's on my podcast with me. And she says, you don't mind if I straighten up? No, 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 you go for for gold. Because innately, it just doesn't feel right for those people if everything isn't organized in its place. Now, the perceiving types, who are you and I, when we pop something down, we might be leaving it for later to use or we might actually forget it's there and find it in a couple of weeks, but that doesn't really matter to us. But the judging type swoops in and puts it away and we turn around, it's gone. It's like, oh, seriously? And their judgment of us is you're messy and I don't like the word lazy, but their judgment of us is that we're lazy and we don't put things away. And I always say to people, no such thing as lazy. It's it's the perception of the person that's thinking that. So if you are a person that gets a whole lot done in your day, you might look at the people that don't and go, they're lazy. Not necessarily. They might just be working at their own pace and doing things their way. You know, it's a very different thing. I look at people that are super busy and go, oh, my God, OCD, uh, you know, just doing too much. How could you cope? So very different ways of looking at things. So the perceiving types often don't declutter either. They leave their things in bowls or in places around. They often develop to be big bundles of things. Whereas the judging household, you, if you walk into a judging household, you'll know it. They'll, it'll be quite clear surfaces. Everything will have its spot. It'll be kind of perfect. My daughter is living with a judging type and she's a perceiving type and she listened to our podcast the other week and she said to her partner, oh, my goodness, Kirsty and her husband are so you and I, you yes. know, like that's exactly how it works. Nothing right or wrong about that, but as long as you understand the other person's interpretation of that and the thing that it actually did for their relationship listening to the podcast was that they actually have a joke about it now. The last couple of weeks they've been joking about, oh, well, I've left it there. Now, Sam, just don't move that, okay, because that's there for a purpose for me to come back to later. So it creates a conversation. And, you know, when you talk about judging people with personality tools, we can all do that. But I actually spoke to an Enneagram person the other week and she said, really, it's all about you. Yes. It's what you think and how you feel. And I say to people, until you've done the models that I have and take the tools that I have, I can think that you might be something, but it's you. It's you that has to be the person that answers all these questions and puts them into place. That's not not for me to judge or make any judgment around that. Yeah, which is really interesting because after I had had some conversations with you, and we've had quite a few now, I got my family to do an online quiz around mm-hmm. Myers-Briggs and I've done it. But then my son was the first one to do it and he was answering these questions and telling us what his answers were all the way along. And I was like, oh my goodness, you're so much <laughs> like your dad, like, because I thought he yeah. was. And then when Simon did the test, he came out slightly different to Oliver, very similar, but one thing was different. And yeah. I was all like, ah, oh, see, it just 
mm-hmm. showed me my judgment is not always right. <laughs> Yes, And my presumption is not always right because they weren't exactly the same. They're very similar. So then when Simon was doing the same questions and we were asking him and he was telling us his answers, he's like, no, I didn't answer the same as my son on that one. Or yes, I did. So it's just, you know, I know I'm not the only one, but maybe I am that very presumptuous around. Yes oh, you're so much like your dad or you're so much like me or you're so much like so-and-so. <laughs> but it is, we do we do that with physical looks even, don't we? Oh, doesn't he look like his mum? And doesn't she, oh, doesn't she look like a dad? You know, with, with physical aspects, that personality aspects, I guess we do the same thing. And sometimes we're not right, sometimes we are. And as I was talking to the Enneagram lady the other day, I'd done my profile online and she and I did agree that sometimes when you do your profiles online, you don't always get the right result. A Mm. lot of the people that come into my workshops, because I talk things through, they'll actually say, oh, I did this online, but actually it's usually one letter that they'll change. And Mm -hmm. I myself, when I did a three-day course on it, came home after that course and decided I thought I was an organised structured person, uh, came home and realised that was not the case and changed my profile to suit who I am today, which is me all over, as we discussed, you and I, very similar. <laughs> and we're great personality we, types. We're wonderful. <laughs> we are. I think it's really interesting also with those type of personality testings across the board, you have to have a level of insight to yourself, don't you? Yes, you do. And be very honest, not who you desire to be. So it's Mm -hmm. really challenging to do those questionnaires sometimes, especially if somebody else is asking you to do it, like an employer is asking you to do it, or your spouse or your mum is asking you to do Mm -hmm. it, like (laughs) that you have to really let your ego go and go, what am I really? Like even you just talking, we've already had part of this conversation before, but you, when you were explaining an extrovert and an introvert and you said, oh, introverts are often reading. And I was like, oh, no, that's what I was like as a child. Like my sister would nag me all holidays to play with her, but I'd rather be reading a book. <laughs> and so I'm all like, am I? Am I an oh. introvert? Am I actually an introvert. <laughs> I don't know. And I think you have to read your profiles too to work that out. Because the other thing is I read, I had a librarian as a mum and dad. My, they were librarians, right? Yeah. And we lived in a small town. The other five members of my family are introverts. I never went out. I played with the kids down the street, but I was a bit of a fussy extrovert really deep down. I didn't really want to play with some of those children, so I didn't go out and play down the street, whatever. You know, in year year, um, eight, I read 450 books that year, and that's because that's what I did. So it wasn't actually until I went to university and I went to the city and I went to university that I actually fell into who I was. If I hadn't had those years of being an introvert at home, I think I probably would be such an extrovert I'd never be home. So that experience for me was really great, but I was not living life with the same joy that I live it today. Yeah. And that's what I'm like, I think it's fascinating still at, you know, almost 46, Mm. I'm still trying to figure out who I am. Mm. Mm. And like we were having a conversation too around how uh, your children's generation and then my children's generation are so different to us in that they're so much more aware, self-aware, and that you know, that can be around the technology that they consume and like the social media that they consume and the information, like, you know, the Mm. only reason that you knew about personalities is because you read a book 37 years ago. There was not the internet 37 years ago. Whereas now we've got podcasts that people can listen to and learn about personalities and we've got social media and YouTube Mm. and like there's so much opportunity to learn about yourself. But all that to say, keep talking about personalities because I think that it does take some level of self-awareness, but also we can ask other people or how, tell me what you think about so, asking other people around their thoughts and then all right. figuring yeah. out 
their perception you know because I yeah, know my because my husband will go oh no that's not you you do this and but I know mm-hmm. my motivation mm-hmm. my reasons for doing it and he's just presuming them and because he's who he is he'll tell you who he thinks you are <laughs> and, and and you're probably wrong about who you think you are anyway so don't worry about that <laughs> and it's not a reflection on Simon per se it's no, a reflection Simon, we on love his Simon. we love Simon. personality but he's Talk. just looking at you and thinking you got it all wrong baby you know like <laughs> I know, I know what I'm talking about. But like you say, you have to hang on to that yourself internally rather than someone tell you who you are. You just nod your head. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for your input. That's really great. But the thing um, about personalities too is to our temperament. So when we talk about our temperament, we've got the personality type, which forms a four-letter profile. But we've also got our behaviours. So my husband's behaviours are very boss like behaviors he loves to delegate give people chores he he loves to go out he works really hard he doesn't take no he wants to be the leader uh he told our kids when they were in races don't come second doesn't count first you know no one talks about second you know stuff like that they're not too psychologically harmed i think they're still okay but but so for him that's how he saw life and i spent a long time trying to fix that and make him different but my kids know who he is. Do you get what I mean? Like often we want to change someone, but I just explain to kids, this is dad. (laughs) This is what he's like. He's amazing help for them. He helps them out all the time. And when he gets too bossy, as we say, delegating, they know that it's out of love. So it's really important to know and understand that. So for me and my personality type, I just amass friends and people that I really like. But without Paul there, I wouldn't be where we are today in our um, businesses and life because I wouldn't have the drive and the motivation. So there are four different temperaments that's really worth going and having a read about. And Personality Plus is still a great book to look it up. It's got a quiz in the front. And look, unfortunately, the lady who wrote it's died. I think she lived to be about 100, but it, it never gets old. It's who we are. And so what you need to understand is that if you're a certain type, you can see it be a different temperament. So my daughter went out with a young man who was very easygoing, really cruisy temperament. And my husband and I loves going out and getting stuff done. So for her, in the end, he just couldn't make a decision. And she just used to say to me, I don't know what to do. I really like him, but, you know, he doesn't know where to go to dinner. He doesn't, you know, so for her, he wasn't right temperament wise. And my son's a melancholic, so he's very detailed and structured. So you can be a type, but you can also be a temperament. And they both make a combination in the Enneagram slots on right in there with all of that (laughs) stuff as well, as we've discovered. But I just think the more you discover about yourself, it does help you balance and look at your family. Because knowing and understanding, Cassie, Paul and I are all last minute types. So we can get out of the house in five minutes. If we all decide we're going to movies, we can get out. Jack needs, and I used to think it was odd when he was young because I had never, never met encountered anybody. It. Well, I did. <laughs> yeah, never encountered it because it never been obvious for me. I never had to. My mum is just like him. Paul's mother is like him. But we'd never lived with him for a long time and, you know, had no realisation around it. I just loved it because mum kept the house tidy. I didn't know she was a specific type of person. So for Jack, we always warn him when, when we're going to go out. We try and give him a 15-minute heads up before we get out of the house. If he plans something for us to join in, we make sure we stay on track nowadays. Back in the day, we used to change a little bit, but I tell him we're going to do something. He expects that's going to be done. Mm. That creates great stress in me as a person because I love to change my mind. (laughs) But (laughs) I actually say to Paul, we have to do this. You know, we have to honour this. And that's the same with life. If you're a perceiving type like you and I are, in life there are rules, there are places to be, there's work to be done. You know, you can't turn up when you feel like it. You can't just have that kind of life unless you plan it and, you know, live it like we are now where we can actually engage in a certain amount of freedom and pop things in the way we like. So really understanding a family around that is very, very important and I just believe that everybody should, you know, look at these tools and you know, like I say, I'm always available for people to work with online. I think it's just something that you know, it helps you understand. I understood my teenagers. You know, Cassie, Cassie I knew was always going to have a floor robe. I just close that bedroom door and teenagers go through that phase. But Jack was a neater teenager. The, uh, the things he really cared about were always organised. Cassie's were just 
on her bed or on her floor. And she's grown up and developed habits because as you talk about habits with decluttering, (laughs) habits are really, really important. And she is now she's moved out of home, developing habits that support being neat and tidy in her own house. She didn't develop them when she was with us. (laughs) And I think that that's one of the key frustrations. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> with parents is that lots of times kids don't develop that until no. they're adults living by themselves. <laughs> mm. And I always, I, my mum had four kids and she said to me, oh, at one of my brother's weddings, she kind of said, oh, I feel so sorry for her. He's such a male and chauvinist pig. I really should have done a much better job. And I said, don't worry, mum, he'll shape up. She'll, she'll work on him. You know, that's, that's just life. And yeah, it's amazing when they do go that all the things you nag them about, they suddenly do. So Mm. there you go. There's a little bit of hope sitting out there for those people. But also on my show, I have all these wonderful parenting specialists who, you know, talk about how to get the best out of your kid and, you know, stop a meltdown. And I wish I had that knowledge when I was younger too, because I just think like you, everyone's got a plethora of knowledge and you just have podcasts now they can just tap into. Because I do want your listeners to know that since I've talked with you, (laughs) my pantry's been decluttered, my shed's been decluttered, my wardrobe's been decluttered, and I've done it very slowly and on impulse when I wanted to do it. (laughs) But it's been amazing. Yeah. And I think that that's one of the reasons that we both have podcasts, but also one of the reasons that I called this new season of the podcast Curious Freedom because I want people to get curious about themselves and about the world that they live in and experiment and play and practice and that's why I'm excited to have you on. So tell us more about temperaments, like tell us about the four temperaments because I think that will be helpful too. Cool. Okay. So now these all sound very phlegmatic-y because they're Hippocrates temperaments. So I take that. Now Hippocrates was supposedly born 450 years before Christ. So that's a long time ago to have developed these things. So the first one is the sanguine, who is the party person, the lively person, the person that physically touches everybody in the room, gives them hugs and, you know, very vivacious usually. That's me. So when I discovered that was me at 25, I was a school teacher. And I used to go into our staff room and I would hug everybody in there. And when I'd done this whole thing, there are other people out there who don't like hugs. And I never knew that. Who would have I was, thought? Oh, fancy that. <laughs> I just thought everybody liked me. And these days you probably wouldn't even do that. But, you know, we're talking back in the 90s, yeah. like 80s and 90s. Yeah. So I actually took it on board and I walked in the staff room and I could actually see physically people withdrawing from me if I went to open my arms. And That was a light bulb moment in, oh my goodness, I'm not seeing the world through anyone else's eyes. It's only been through mine. So it gives you the gift of looking through Mm -hmm. other people's eyes because not everybody's like you. So it would be so much easier if they were, because then we would understand each other better. But we'd agree, we'd agree (sighs) on everything. It'd be so much fun. (laughs) You and I'd have a party world. Yes. (laughs) Nothing would get done, but we'd have a party. That, but we'd have a fun time doing nothing. <laughs> we would. We would. We'd really enjoy ourselves and, and everybody have a good time with us. That's the oh, thing. And we and, would get lots done. It would just be half measures of lots and mm, lots of stuff mm, because mm. the shiny object would come along and we'd be like, oh, let's go do yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. And nothing needs to be perfect because what is perfect? You know, exactly. we wouldn't have any hang ups on perfection. So it's all exactly. good. <laughs> Let's create that utopia gate. Yeah, that would be nice. That would be nice because then we've got the melancholics, okay? So the melancholics would be very stressed in our world. So they love, they're a bit like their judging type. They love a structure. They love a routine. They love a planner. I'm just about to interview a wonderful woman who has a book called, oh, can't remember. It's about being a super mum and it's amazing and it's so organised And she talks about building habits like you do, but it just stresses me her life reading it because she is an amazingly organized woman, but a lot of it's innate and a lot of it she's put into practice, but a lot of it is innate. I'm very happy with who I am because I do understand myself. Do you get what I mean? Yeah. And it's really challenging when you mm. don't recognize that people are different. 
and are created different and cannot do anything about their created being. And yet you're having people speak to you because they find it really easy. Mm-hmm. And they're like, oh my gosh, like, mm-hmm. you know, just like the thinking and feeling type, like us feelers are like, well, why can you not feel my deep pain or my mm-hmm. deep joy at the moment? And they're like, yeah. it's not logical. I don't mm-hmm. get it. And mm-hmm. the same, they're like, why is this so hard for you? You know, and that's the same for anything. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, some people find maths really easy. Some people find English really easy. Mm-hmm. So I have learned over time to take everything that people say that people should do with a yeah. grain of salt because that can work for them. And that's why I'm like, I hope that through all of my podcasts, people can hear that you need self-compassion for yourself. Yes. And that this conversation hopefully encourages people to recognize that they can learn more about themselves so that they can understand how to sit gently in the world instead of trying to be somebody they're not created to be. Yeah, which is exactly right. And this wonderful woman writes really beautifully and chunks it all down. And already I've taken some stuff away because you always take stuff away from something. And it's amazing, but it's not me. I recognize that reading the whole thing. And uh, I was talking to my daughter about your thing about leaving. If you're running late for, you know, if you're a person that last minute for school, leave the hair ties and the hairbrush by the door. And Cass said to me, but why would, why would you do that? That's not tidy. And I said, no, if it's not your thing to be ultra tidy, that that's okay. I said, and if you are that person that likes tidiness, you have it in a nice box by the door. But I said, <laughs> it's all about the smoothness of your routines. You know, it's all about what feels right for you as you go through the day. And if you're doing something that doesn't feel right, you don't do it. Mm. You know, it doesn't happen. So therefore, it's really great to build the habits that you talk about as well. There are all habits that we can build that might make our life easier but we need to build them at our own pace and to what suits our own personality type and our style so that we don't end up doing all of this stuff and feeling stressed and overwhelmed because it doesn't sit well with us. Yes. So the, the melancholic Keep loves, preaching it, friend. <laughs> yeah. The, lo- the melancholic just loves order and, you know, this planning and they're very sensitive people and they're often very musical and they're often introverts, the melancholic. So for them, a disorganised house is stressful. Okay, it it really stresses them. A disorganized room, someone who's got no idea about planning. Uh, just a quick story. We're planning a trip overseas next year. And usually my thing is with planning a trip is that I decide three months out and go, right, I think we'll go to Europe or we'll do something this year. And I book it with my perceiving relaxed travel agent and we just go for it. So I announced that uh, we were going to go to Canada and to USA possibly next year to some friends and they're judging types, right? They love structure and order. So they said to me, oh, we'd like to go to New York. And I said, you're welcome to come along, you know, go for it. So they said to me the next day, so when are you going? And it's June next year. I'm anticipating traveling. And I'm like, oh, um, I don't know. They said, have you spoken to your travel agent about it yet? <laughs> I don't know. No, so, I'll give her a heads up in that's March. Right, that's right. <laughs> so I'm sitting there and we've actually have organised some fares have come out really cheaply. So my travel agent said, look, if you do want to book it this far out, you can because you're not going to get fares like this again. Yeah. So I am and I'm feeling quite stressed booking that far in advance, but I've told my friends <laughs> and they are so excited because now they can plan their trip. Mm-hmm. They can plan. Now I'm a bit short of breath for about six months because I, I and they'll be what saying, if something what you better go? comes along That's and right. I want to go yeah. to Japan instead. Yes. yes. Oh, what if a bit of flight? You, know, you, I can, know. you can always get yes. great tickets at the last minute. You're like, why am I, why am I doing this? Why have I locked so, in oh, seven grand so, when I yes. could pay four yes. grand next month or in six months time? I know. Yes. I see you. Yes. I yes. See thank you. you. And I know there are going to be people out there that are going, don't be stupid. That's crazy. And there are people out there that are going to be like you and I, and they're going to go, score. That's exactly how I feel about all of this. So it is recognizing the different types. So, and I know this friend's going to be 70 and she really wants to be there. So recognizing their need to be tied in and understanding I have got a great airfare. I'm willing to do it. <laughs> so I'm doing it. Just but, don't look at any other airfares no, ever again. Because no, no, then you won't. won't know. Who knows? No. This no, is- no, I'll get my tra- travel agent not to tell me if there's anything cheaper happening anywhere. <laughs> and and you see, they'll want to plan the New York section now. 
And I'm thinking, I'm not going to plan until just before I go, you know, like, yeah. So these are real stresses for both types. And mm-hmm. and you, and if once you understand that, you have to sit in someone else's shoes. If you're a thinking type, it's, I had a whole lot of accountants once. I said, look, you need to step into someone else's shoes and see the world through their eyes because it's not always through yours. And one of them popped their hand up and they said, you mean manipulate them? Oh, okay, you're talking to the wrong audience. I'm a feeling type and I'm talking about feelings and they're talking about logic. So I got back into a logical conversation and I said to them, actually, yes, you probably are manipulating them. You're getting them to do what you want, but you're doing it in a nice way and you're trying to do it through the way that they might like it done. And they all nodded their heads. And I came home and I said to my family, who are all thinking types, I said, oh, you should have heard what these guys said at this accounting group. You know, they they said manipulation. Me. I had to agree and that hurt me to say and yes. My family all nodded and said, Well, that's what you're doing, isn't it? You are manipulating them. <laughs> so I thought, you know what? This is so true. I've just talked to 25 accountants who all nodded their head, who are thinking types. I'm talking to my three members of my family who are going, You're right. So how differently do those people naturally think to us? Nobody's nobody's taught them to think like that. This is an innate logical thing. So when I tell my daughter or some a feeling thought, I'm really sad about this, they'll come in with the logic. Well, why are you sad about it? What did that person do wrong? I can't believe you're feeling sad about that because really if you look at it, blah, 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 this is how it looks. And for them. That is how it looks. Yeah. And and but the thing is that logic sometimes can pull you right out of that feeling thing and get you into shape again. Do you get what I mean? Sometimes Mm -hmm. we need that. And we have both. You and I both have logic. It's just it's not our first thought. And we don't really always feel at ease using it. But the world is logical as well. And it's really important to have those people in your family. And you've got a couple of thinking types. It's really important for that to land with you and for you to go, all right, so what is it out of their thinking that I can take on board that's actually might relieve my situation or make it feel better? It's it's really, really quite important to look at the world in that sense because then we've got the choleric, which is my husband, and I'm not sure about yours, who loves to delegate and get things moving and always helping other people move to, and should is a very common word <laughs> in the language. And Really, they're a dynamo. They're kind of a human dynamo and they get stuff organised. And for them, sitting around, not making a decision, not doing anything, is frustrating. So they're the kind of type that needs to be kept busy on a plan or a project all the time. That keeps them happy. Knowing and understanding that is really great. So if you have a choleric in your life, a child or even, giving them projects or allowing them to choose their project, let's not give them a project, allowing them to choose what direction they want to go in and what project they'd like to do in, and enabling that for them is a really great role and complimenting them on their decisiveness and how brilliant they are at handballing skills because a lot of the time in life people get overrun, overwhelmed because they're not good at delegating. They're sitting there trying to do everything themselves and they're not actually handballing out the things that they're trying to do really well or that are stressing them. So delegation is an, also an art and the choleric usually has that down really well. So, you know, the melancholic might tend to be more the person that does everything and nobody pays attention. They're always organising everything and they tend to martyr themselves a little bit. And why Why me? I'm, I'm sitting here, no one's thanked me, no one's done anything. So different balances. And then we have the phlegmatic. Now, the phlegmatic is lovely. Everybody loves the phlegmatic because they sit on the fence. So if you ask them a question, they can see both sides of the story. You want them to make a decision. They can't really make a decision because they don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. They don't really want to upset the apple cart. However, when these people dig their heels in, they are in. My mother is one of these people which is lovely, 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 and then all of a sudden something might happen and it's very rare and her heels go in and she will not move. She will not budge. So these people drive the choleric crazy because the choleric wants a decision and wants to get people moving. They love them because they're easygoing, but they get frustrated because they won't do anything. They won't make up their mind. They can't make a decision. But for the rest of the personality types, these people are just really gorgeous to have around. But once again, their weakness is their stubbornness and their inability to make a decision. So weaknesses are your strengths. So you can be a great delegator or you can be bossy. You can be a fun party person or you can be overwhelming and just taking up too much airspace. So there are a lot of good and bad about everything and really our strengths 
just become our weaknesses or our strengths if we can find our balance. It's a really mm-hmm. great area to be in. Oh, and it just makes me go, oh my goodness, like I can see how these personality types come out in clutter. And then like when you're enmeshing it with Myers-Briggs and then you're enmeshing them within family dynamics Mm. and the different mixtures of all of it. Because like, as you said, you can have like a ENTJ Mm. that can be any of those four. Yeah. Less likely to be melancholic, but the other temperaments, all four people in your family could be the same Myers-Briggs. Unlikely, but they could be. But it could happen. Yep. But you could have four different temperaments. Yeah. And so you could yeah. drive each other mad on you temperaments. Could, just from that angle. Yeah. And apart from the fact that if you're an ENTJ, you're probably telling each other what to do anyway. And and ENTJs can have a bit of melancholic in them because the J is a little bit of a melancholic. So an ENTJ family would be talking lots, they'd be critiquing lots, and they'd be organized. So Imagine that. But like you say, if you were a sanguine of those, you would be very extrovert and want to go out all the time. The choleric would want to get jobs done. The melancholic would want it all done so neat and tidily. And the phlegmatic wouldn't really care. So we often discuss, my daughter and I go out and watch people make sandwiches in in Subway and places like that. And you can actually distinguish their temperaments by how they make their sandwich. You know, the melancholic is painfully slow asks you exactly how much avocado you want on there and how many slices of cheese. And they drive us nuts because we're usually in a hurry and we don't want to hang around while they nicely spread the mayonnaise on the sandwich and put it between the sandwich cutter and slowly saw the knife backwards (laughs) and forwards. But then you have the choleric who doesn't give a damn about how that sandwich goes together, just put it together now and messily wrap it up. You'll notice the wrapping especially because a melancholic will wrap it beautifully, a choleric won't, a phleg won't really care. And a sanguine will be so busy talking that they'll forget your order and have to keep asking you what's actually in the sandwich because they're really talking to you at the same time they're making it. So we have fun. <laughs> oh, I find this all so fascinating. Yes. So <laughs> we will end our conversation here today, but let people know how they can get in contact with you and where they can follow you. And I'll put it all in the show notes for people, but some people are audio learners, so yes, tell us. Yes. And, you know. So my podcast is Parenting and Personalities, and I kind of go between parenting and personalities separate to that and then both of them together. And I have got some amazing people like yourself on my show just to point out different aspects of life and different personalities. I've got a website, thepersonalitycoach at gmail.com, and I happily respond to anybody that will get in contact. And I promise that I will respond as quickly as possible if anyone does contact me, because please tend to leave things for a day or so. So have some understanding around that, although I understand things should be done immediately. Yeah. So uh, just get in contact. Love to hear from people. Love to even hear about us talking today. That would be pretty cool. Yeah. So that's me. So the details will be in the show notes and uh, look forward to hearing maybe from some of the listeners. Yeah. Well, thank you, Kate. It's been a joy. If you would like to talk more about personalities and hash out what you and your family might be, do it with Kate, but also come over and share with us in our Facebook group. I would love to talk more about this. You all know how much I love personalities. So come over to my Facebook group. The link is in the show notes as well. And until next week, enjoy figuring out what your personality is. And thank you again, Kate, for being on. I really appreciate you. It's been an absolute pleasure and so much fun. Yay.